Hello, I'm Marcia McNutt, President of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and it's my pleasure today to be addressing the Irish Center for Research in Applied Geosciences. I'm really sorry that because of the continuing pandemic, I'm not able to join you in person, especially since I have never been to Ireland, even though I have strong Irish uh, heritage on my mother's side. Today, I'm gonna to talk about geoscience partnerships for sustainability. I don't have to tell this audience about the plagues of the 21st century, which involve geosciences. We have climate change. We have um, the lack of raw materials because we don't have a circular economy, which then also results in trash building up. And uh, all of these problems are made worse by inequality. Looking at this lower uh, picture on the left, it doesn't take any effort to understand who are the haves and who are the have nots in this, in this picture. So I wanna talk about two different kinds of partnerships which we need to develop in order to address these problems. One is partnerships with other stakeholders, uh, academic scientists working with government and communities and industry in order to solve the challenges of our time. But I also want to talk about convergence, which is a partnership with other disciplines. Convergence is defined as the integration of engineering, physical sciences, geosciences, life sciences, computation, and social sciences in order to provide profound benefits for society. This is the cover of a 2011 report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine on the topic. Now, convergent type research, which is partnerships with other disciplines, differs from interdisciplinary research in a number of dimensions. The education is different. Instead of students following standard disciplinary curriculum, students are educated in highly complex multidisciplinary problem solving. In terms of the conduct of research, um, interdisciplinary involves uh, two or more research groups approaching a problem from more than one disciplinary dimension. Whereas convergent research is truly transdisciplinary. It involves the integration of knowledge, tools, and ways of thinking from multiple disciplines. In terms of physical space, in an interdisciplinary project, researchers still re reside in conventional disciplinary departments, although sometimes transient and often virtual centers can provide a focus for interdisciplinary problem solving. Whereas in convergent research, researchers actually are physically co-located in multidisciplinary institutes that span science, engineering, social science, and of course, public policy. Funding in an interdisciplinary project usually involves the different research groups going to their own disciplinary funding uh, sources, um, which puts the project in multiple jeopardy of failing if any one aspect of the interdisciplinary team is not supported. Whereas in convergent research, special funding programs are devoted to convergent research projects, and it allows for one submission of a proposal to cover all of the investigators, regardless of their discipline. Let me give you a concrete example of both convergence and partnership in solving an important problem in the geosciences. And the problem I wanna discuss is how earthquakes uh, cause um, huge damage to society and loss of life. Earthquakes are unpredictable. Hundreds of thousands can perish in a single event. And geoscientists actually have shown much success in addressing the problem through convergence of geoscience research with engineers and social scientists, and also partnerships with um, communities and other government leaders to build resilience. So the way the problem has been addressed is it starts with geoscientists understanding where are the areas that have elevated hazard for earthquakes. You can see the red zones in California, but elsewhere in the US too, 
where we know that uh, destructive earthquakes have happened in the past. Um, the geoscientists work across the geosciences you know, with uh, geophysicists working with soil scientists, et cetera, in order to characterize what the strong ground motion would be in any one region um, from the maximum earthquake that could be sustained on those faults. Having the strong ground motion known, then geoscientists work with engineers in order to determine what sort of structural designs will allow buildings to shake but not fall apart in the strongest uh, earthquake expected. Engineers then work with architects in order to turn those engineering designs into building um, and architectural requirements. And then they work with public policymakers to turn that into building codes, which then um, make sure that gradually the uh, built uh, environment is brought up to standards such that people won't die from earthquakes. This has been going on for a long time in the US. And uh, to this day, it is very rare that anyone will die in an earthquake in the US. The same strategy has been adopted in Chile, uh, Turkey, and other parts of the country or other parts of the world to also reduce uh, earthquake risk and benefit society. Now, these same kind of approaches could be used in other um, topics in the geosciences. One is climate change, one of the sustainable development goals. Um, climate projections for the next century for Ireland are fairly dire. They indicate changes in wind speed uh, and storm tracks to create more chaos, increased likelihood of river and coastal flooding, changes in distribution of plant and animal species due to temperature changes, and also offsets in phenology, which is the timing of life cycle events, such that uh, plants that need to bloom in order to feed animals are um, happening earlier uh, than the birth cycle of the animals, uh, creating uh, problems for ecosystems. Um, there's going to be water stress for crops, pressure on water supply and adverse impacts on water quality and negative impacts, therefore, to human health and well-being from all these problems. Now, it turns out Ireland has actually been one of the leaders in the EU in installing wind energy, second only to Denmark. Um, overall, the uh, amount of energy from renewable sources in Ireland um, as uh, recently as 2018 was 11%. Most of that renewable energy comes from very abundant wind power, um, which uh, can help Ireland um, convert to renewable energy. However, transportation is actually the single largest sector of energy use and has the lowest share of renewables in Ireland. 97% of transportation sector is still from fossil fuels. Now I expect that in Ireland, much like in the US, there's been a reluctance to embrace electric vehicles on account of distance limits of how far you can go with them and also the time needed to recharge. However, a greater uptake of electric vehicles could actually solve the problem of fossil fuel release uh, from the transportation sector because of other ways of getting the energy. For example, roadways have abundant energy. They have solar friction, they have, um, or they have solar energy, they have friction from vehicles moving on the pavement and stopping, and also tire pressure on them. All of these could be used for inductive charging, as well as connecting roadways to uh, wind turbines uh, in the vicinity. But in order to make this dream a reality, we would need geoscientists to predict the future weather and climate conditions on roadways so that they can um, stand up to greater rainfall or perhaps uh, snow or ice cover. And they have to work in um, concert with material scientists, with engineers, and with public policy planners in order to make um, such a um, electric charging on roadways a reality.
we go to another topic, and that is the conflict between human health and well being with life below water, which is caused by the use of sunscreen. We know that sunscreens are necessary for human health, especially uh, as applied to fair Irish skin, but it can damage coral reefs. Ireland actually has uh, a number of uh, deep water coral reefs that could be in jeopardy. Coral reefs are the ocean's rainforest. They're hotspots for biodiversity. But the oxybenzone and other chemicals from sunscreens seep into the water and get taken up by corals. Their nanoparticles disrupt the, the corals' reproduction and growth cycles, ultimately lead to bleaching events. Now, the, the topic of uh, coral health and human health because of sunscreens is um, being taken up at a current study at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, that report will be due out soon. But when it comes out, we will definitely need partnerships of uh, geoscientists working with um, experts in human health and uh, oceanographers and um, uh, product um, designers, and, as well as industry, and perhaps even setting new public policy in order to protect human health while still not endangering our coral reefs. Now, in order to promote the kind of partnerships I've mentioned in um, uh, natural hazards and in human health and in environmental health, we need to promote new kinds of partnerships uh, in terms of institutional organization um, that can promote these partnerships, funding streams, hiring and promotion criteria, education programs, as well as providing some higher quality publishing outlets that encourage team and interdisciplinary convergent approaches. As an example of what can be done, I go back to the time when I was director of the US Geological Survey. When I arrived at the USGS, it had a traditional organizational structure that was in disciplinary units, much like the typical university. There was a geology group, a biology group that mostly dealt with threatened and invasive species, a water group that was basically all hydrologists and a geography group that were map makers. I reorganized the US around issues for society, such as um, providing plentiful energy and minerals, providing ecosystems that actually support uh, society through their ecosystem services. Um, a natural hazards group dealing with earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, landslides, uh, and of course uh, that had to involve um, uh, mapping as well as um, geoscientists, geophysicists, um, biologists, etc. Um, a climate change group and water, which instead of being all hydrologists, was now an interdisciplinary theme, which involved all of the science necessary to deal with um, making water abundant and of appropriate quality for its use. And that involved, of course, um, social scientists as well. This new organizational structure has survived to this day and has created a more um, collaborative uh, science um, uh, approach within the USGS. In terms of funding, um, as I said, the need is to avoid double or triple jeopardy in funding convergent research. Um, Convergence is now one of the US National Science Foundation's 10 big ideas. One directorate provides the home for convergence, but the goal is to engage whatever scientists are necessary to solve the problem at hand. Industrial research labs and government labs may need to adjust budgetary process to support convergent teams. I just showed a previous example from the USGS whereby reorganizing structurally, we could also reorganize in a budgetary sense to provide the funding for those convergent teams. Another big topic that needs to be addressed is who gets promoted. 
from the top down, the institution needs to buy into the culture of convergence. As currently constructed, promotion in most organizations um, involves a disciplinary hurdle. Someone is not gonna get hired and not gonna get promoted unless within their discipline, they are first viewed as uh, important and contributing. Um, and it's also focused on the individual, not team contributions. We have to move away from a complete disciplinary focus and an individual focus um, if we want to encourage convergent research. So as one example, when I was director of the USGS, I remember a case where a rather young seismologist was promoted to the ST, which is a super grade um, within the uh, USGS, which provides additional compensation and autonomy for the scientists. In being promoted to the ST super grade, that one young seismologist got letters from non-traditional stakeholders. We had a letter from the premier of China and a letter from the president of the Red Cross telling about how this young scientist's work had saved lives uh, from earthquake um, events and had promoted greater resilience um, and uh, faster response time uh, to events. In terms of education, we're going to need a workforce for convergence that is unlikely to emerge from conventional departmental curricula. Students need radically different education in multidimensional problem solving. They need to understand the language and research approaches of other fields, but at the same time, they also need to bring strong expertise from the frontiers of a relevant field. A student who's a mile wide, but an inch deep in terms of their knowledge of um, an important field is not going to be a valued member of the team. Some helpful approaches are to take, um, allow students to do lab rotations to um, vastly different um, areas of science, but still addressing the same problem. Industry internships can also be important for um, uh, promoting convergence and uh, partnerships. And teaching young researchers to communicate without jargon is also very important. Um, a convergent team will not survive if the various members of it can't understand each other. We also have to address the problem of where convergent research can be published. Traditional disciplinary journals do not have the scope, the readership, or the reviewers to handle convergent research. And we also have to worry about what kind of credit the various team members will get. If you have a highly convergent project, which is published in a biology journal, then the engineers and the geoscientists and the social scientists may not get the credit that they're due for that work from um, their uh, own peers. When I was editor in chief of science, I started a journal called Science Advances which has published a lot of very exciting convergent research. Science Advances had as its um, original concept that it would be a place where researchers from any number of disciplines could come together to publish a single article that would be well-respected by all. So what sort of outcomes might ensue if the geosciences become more serious about developing these, dis these disciplinary partnerships as well as um, partnerships with other stakeholders. Well, first of all, new partnerships between dissimilar disciplines and disconnected stakeholders could emerge such that industries beyond just mining and petroleum really pay attention to what's happening in the geosciences. We could create new career paths for our students in the geosciences on a much broader range of problem solving. New industries would emerge clustered around convergence institutes. It is the adoption of convergence, which is widely credited with the rebirth of new industries and new employers in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area. Geosciences would increasingly be perceived as contributing to competitiveness, 
resiliency, health, sustainability, and quality of life by a broad and racially diverse population. And finally, geosciences would be widely viewed as part of the solution, not just as the people who are defining the problems that the planet faces. So thank you very much for your time today. I am so pleased to have had this opportunity to uh, address you all. And um, I definitely uh, hope your meeting is a great success. Thank you all very much.